So we are live recording now. Um, everything that we say can and will be held against us will live forever. So for the sake of the recording, welcome everybody. This is a uh, our first webinar here for ostensibly Ontario teachers, but we know there are people from across the country and across the world who have chosen to join in. Uh, we do appreciate you guys coming out and uh, sort of interacting with us today. The session is going to be First 25 minutes or so is gonna be a presentation and then we're gonna do maybe 35 minutes depending on how things go. And then from there, we're gonna move into sort of a and A with the crowd. So you can put your questions in now and uh, save them up for later and then we'll go through them and uh, get a sense of who's gonna ask what questions and we'll bring them into the crowd, we'll organize them that way. I'll also say that you can upvote questions so that if you think a question is particularly good, you are gonna ask the same question. You can click upvote and that question will rise to the top and then uh, we'll uh, have a better chance to answer again. So session first and then um, we'll do the Q&A at the end. During the whole program, however, you can uh, write in the chat room, which is cool. And you can also, like I said, put those questions in whenever you like. To the person who asked um, if they, they can't see anything except for two people who said hi, um, I'm not sure if you're seeing the same chat as everyone, but if you look at the bottom of your screen, you should see little people heads that look like participants. It says participants. And then there are two different spaces that um, have kind of comic chat bubbles. Yeah. One is the chat for casual chat and uh, the other one is the Q&A. I'll just to add one other quick thing there. If you are, um it's different if you're on a phone or if you're on a Mac or PC. So if you're on a, um, on a computer, what you'll see in the top right hand corner of your screen is a little button that says either speaker view or gallery view. And when people are speaking, if you click on that, that will change you between following whoever is talking right now to uh, seeing all of the video feeds that are on at the moment. So we're looking at close to the top of the hour. Why don't we give it one minute and then maybe we'll, we'll kick off. Okay. Hi, Fred from South Africa. Uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. That's really great. Um, anybody else coming in from a uh, non Windsor location? You'd like to drop that in the chat room. Ireland. Oh, hi, Damien. Saskatoon. Welcome. Victoria. Davidson. Davidson. Thanks. Hi, Lisa. Ireland is always exciting. Agnes. And PEI. Hey, Nicole. Nicole had the misfortune of working with me for uh, a while when we were at uh, UPI together. So I hope your recovery is going well, Nicole. So did Jason, actually. <laughs> Jason and I worked together too. And we still have a few more people who are actually registering right up into the last second. So there's a few more people who are just joining right now. We are one away from that large goal. That looks great. Thanks everybody for coming in. It's really great. Oh. Yeah. So just so everybody understands, there's only good, we're going to go over this again. And I, for those of you who are hearing me repeat myself over and over again, I said the same thing to the first 15 and then the first hundred, and now we're at uh, uh, 265. So the presentation here is going to come from the three of us. So if you're trying to turn your mic on, sorry. Um, but with uh, 265 people, 270 people in the room, it's going to be tough to get everybody in. You can use the question and answer section and also the chat room to interact. Uh, and those will give you a chance to feed back to the crowd. And then uh, we'll go on from there. It's going to be great. And maybe we'll, we'll get started. Um, welcome, everybody, to remote teaching, a how-to, um, or a a quick kind of overview, at least, of what, what we three have to begin the conversation. My name is Bonnie Stewart. I am an assistant 
Professor of Online Learning at uh, the Faculty of Education at University of Windsor. Currently in my basement. Uh, so I'm Dave Cormier. I am uh, also work at the University of Windsor. I work in the Office of Open Learning with Nick and I'm in charge of digital learning strategy and uh, I am going to be doing the chat room and the Q&A today so and I'll do a little bit of talking but send in your questions we'll organize them and then at about half hour in we'll be able to get to Q&A. And, &A. and uh, I'm Nick Baker I'm the director of open learning at University of Windsor um, uh, also we'll be helping running around with the technical stuff in the background here today um, and each of us is going to do a little bit of the talking as we go along uh, and I imagine lots of question answering as we get to the uh, end of this. Indeed. So basically this is the first of a series of three short webinars each one hour long that we are going to be doing. Um, just one second that should not be happening. Um, always with the tech interesting learning experiences that was auto forwarding. Um, Welcome. And basically we're here. Thanks for joining us educators. We wanted to say, I know that what we're doing right now, trying to go online, um, this is hard. And so Dave and I are partners. Uh, Dave works with Nick. I work with Nick. Um, but Dave and I live in the same house. We have two kids in this house who are basically feral at this point because we're working kind of twice as much to get um, half as much done, it feels like, and I'm sure that that's the case for a lot of educators out there as well. And so we just kind of wanted to, to convene a conversation. We've all spent about 20 years working in online ed, and there are some principles and practices that we've built over the years that we thought might be helpful to share with the teaching community. Um, and at the same time, this isn't really about technology. It's really about how we teach. Um, and so we wanted to start by saying, here we are on Zoom. And I know that many boards in the province, quite rightfully, have said, look, we're not going to teach on Zoom during home learning. And we are fully, fully in support of that. Um, the truth is, uh, Zoom is great for one-to-many webinars, like we're doing now, but it's actual teaching capacities, there's serious privacy issues, but there are also some serious pedagogy issues with the idea of teach, uh, treating your teaching like a webinar. So Zoom works for what we're doing today, but this is not in any way a session about how to teach on Zoom. In fact, we won't be talking all that much about tools as much as the things that we, we do as teachers. Um, we've introduced ourselves, Bonnie, Nick, and Dave. Uh, you'll hear primarily from me, but also from Nick and Dave about their own experiences. And the main message that we wanted to kind of share, we all have spent a long time in e-learning, but we're not folks who are like, yay, Ontario wants to go with mandatory e-learning. Um, this is not a situation where everyone's been forced online that any of us would have wanted to see happen. And this is very much emergency remote learning, which is, which is not the same thing. And so here we are, we all have suddenly, all of our students on our doorstep hungry with no notice, and here we are trying to feed them. And so our role today is just kind of to facilitate a conversation on that learning curve that all of us are on um, so that we can do it together. And Dave is going to talk a little bit. It's not just K-12 teachers. This is also folks in higher ed. And um, even those of us who've been doing this for a long time are on a new learning curve right now. Yeah, so I, I'm fortunate enough to be running um, a course right now for faculty trying to prepare themselves for teaching online this summer. So we've done our emergency stuff, the stuff that you guys are doing now where you're trying to get your mind around what to do today. Right now, we've just moved into starting to prepare for trying to get faculty ready for teaching in the summer. And one of the, we're doing a course, we're doing a, a five day intensive course, which would normally take me about 12 weeks to teach, but I've been trying to, to adapt it and trying to bring it to the point where we can deliver it to faculty so they can get their minds around what we need to be doing to make that turn just into online, to imagine most of what we're trying to do is imagine where our student is and how that is different than them being in our face-to-face -face classroom. Inevitably, the first response we get from people uh, in the course is, just tell me how to make the machine go ping. 
just tell me where the button is. I just want to press the button. And once I press the button, everything's going to be fine. And my normal teaching face-to-face -face is going to be on the internet. And I understand that response. And, and I was just talking to a colleague of mine in the UK who is getting exactly the same response from faculty there. And it's true of all teachers, right? You're expert teachers. You're accustomed to being somebody who really knows how to work with students inside of a classroom. And now the hope is, the hope is that all you need to do is get that one answer and figure out how to do that on the internet. And unfortunately, it's not that easy, right? It's not gonna come down to that. So what we're trying to do with uh, the faculty is give them a sense of how um, they can understand the experience of being online by going through the course online. So they're like, oh, I don't know how to, get, I don't know, understand your instructions. I don't know how to complete the assignment. They're going through that frustration and slowly starting to go, oh, right, this is what it's like for a student out there. All those students are out in real houses doing real things, uh, who have a dog running in, who have something else that they need to get done. They have other disturbances inside their house. And they're starting to understand that moving online is a slow sort of, it's a process of becoming. It's, you get a little bit better at it. You sort of do a little bit more. And um, the three, the thing that I keep talking about inside that classroom is pedagogies of care, right? How can we be thinking about the experience of students having, caring about them, but also caring about ourselves too. And that's the message that I've been giving people. And, and I can tell by the third day, by the fourth day, people start to get it. And they start to understand that this is a, it's a change that we're all trying to make. It's difficult for everybody. The technology can be challenging for everybody, but that the key is to remember that we're all humans and keep the humans in mind and get that done. And that's really what a lot of the presentation is about today is how to get that done. And so when it comes to basically thinking about how we're teaching online, what we're trying to offer is, is a pretty simple mission statement that involves three key ideas. The first is keep it simple. Ideally, you get that minimalist kind of Scandinavian idea around your teaching. Um, it should look like an IKEA catalog, not like an IKEA instruction manual with its 700 steps. Um, you want to give yourself permission to boil the key things down. Um, give yourself permission to do less with your students than you would in a face-to-face -face class, significantly less. The truth is that doesn't necessarily mean less learning, right? Because a lot of what happens in a classroom, I used to teach high school English and social studies. A lot of what happens in a classroom is relational, but it's also about spending time together. And we can't replicate that in an online space or in a home learning space. Um, permission to do less does not mean less learning. Learning isn't actually accounting now, right? You don't have six learnings um, that students have to do in a day. And to an extent, as people start to get the hang of online, there's a tendency or a temptation to go, oh, I'm gonna add more, I'm gonna add more. And what we're suggesting is actually keep it super simple, right? You're not doing the whole curriculum. First thing is keep your goals simple. Basically, pare your content down. This is not school, right? Ideally, and this may be hard for some folks to hear, whatever you're teaching, pick two or three main things a week and stick to that. Anything more is going to be overload, particularly if students have other classes, even if it's just the music teacher and the French teacher, et cetera, et cetera, at the elementary level or multiple other actual kind of subject classes at the high school level. Um, learners and parents also don't have a lot of experience in organizing this type of thing. So fifth graders are not project managers. And if we expect fifth graders to be able to manage a whole bunch of assignments, what's going to happen is they're either going to be just cherry picking and not necessarily doing the ones that you might think are most important, or they're going to gradually pull away and feel like, I can't do this, I'm failing, this is no good. Um, the goals need, those goals need to be things that you go, okay, parents, learners, this is the, the core of what I want you to get at. Some students, I've heard uh, folks talk about, you know, my, my student came home, there may be a seventh grader, and uh, their assignment in home learning was to talk about the denouement in a short story 
but the student wasn't listening. They don't remember what denouement means. Um, the parent may not know what denouement means. So make sure that there are like links in the instructions that you give if people need to know specific pieces of content knowledge. And think about how you're checking for understanding with those things. But keep it boiled down because students may not be able to communicate to parents and the whole family circumstance may not be one where they can manage more than a couple of things in a week. Um, this is a famous project management triangle, right? You can either have it um, good and cheap, fast and cheap, um, or fast and good. Um, and the truth of it is, I, when we're expecting people to do independent projects, to an extent this applies in a learning setting, Obviously, students are not paid to go to school, so there is not a monetary factor in their labor. Thus, we're always working with the cheap element here. And we can either try to get them to do, you know, a whole lot fast, or we can try to get them to do a few things well, um, because we're not going to get all of it together. And so it's, it's really key to keep in mind that the cognitive load of what people can take in in an online space that's unfamiliar to them and what they can put out in these really wild circumstances, right? It suddenly feels difficult to have to put on pants some days. Um, this is, you don't know what's happening in your students' homes. Don't ask more than they're going to be able to give because you, you'll lose them. Um, next thing is keep your communication simple. The clear, brief lay language and links that I mentioned to terms that might not be familiar to parents, to supports that might be out there, great. Um, but also try to draw some explicit links between the concepts that the students might know and the new things that you're trying to build. And consider um, that just asking people for work may not be the best way to keep that relational aspect of your classroom going, right? Students show up in the morning and I'm assuming most of us greet them. How are you today? Check in with them. Figuring out the ways that you're going to do that in your home learning communications is challenging, but it's also really core to keeping some of that sense of two-way relationship going between you and your students, which is part of what keeps all of us open to learning experiences. Um, and finally on simple, platforms. In this province, right, I know that different boards, different districts, we all use different platforms. So we have designed this to be largely platform agnostic. Some of you may be working in Google Classroom. Some of you may be working in Brightspace. Some of you may be working in EdSpeed. Your school district probably has a core platform that you've decided on, and that's great. Particularly if you were using it in any way before the pandemic for some kind of blended learning or communication with parents, because then people have some sense of how to use that. But a lot of those platforms don't do an extraordinarily good job of clear communications or organizing clear communications with families. So be patient with people while they figure it out. More than that, the fact that there are great tools out there that can supplement your learning doesn't mean your students need to try them all this week, this month, or this year. Um, nobody's goal actually for this year is that we try all the great online learning tools out there. If you are asking students to try more than one new thing a week, consider that they have other teachers, consider that they may have siblings in the home. We only have two kids in this house and right now we're on to like five or six different apps. Great, some of them have real value. It so happens that our kids are lucky enough that, that we're comfortable at least trying them and using them. But not everybody's going to find that learning curve easy. So multiple tools at once are really confusing and difficult to manage. Um, and also really important, don't rely on the platforms to do everything for you. You need a backup plan because the tech sometimes goes down. So in terms of keeping things simple, pick a couple of things 
per week that you really want the students to, to learn and go deep with. Um, and maybe that involves one platform outside your main communication platform, but beyond that, try to keep it focused down so that people can get their minds around their week and work sort of towards getting done something within that window of time. Again, no more than three. Equity. Um, I'm just going to move that down there so you can see that. Equitable is part of the reason why simple matters. Treating everyone the same means that some people aren't going to be able to reach the apples on the tree, whereas different people will need different kinds of scaffolds and supports. Actually, in some ways, it's great that we were well into the school year before this happened because most of you know the students that you're working with reasonably well and have some sense of what people need. But at this point, we don't really know what kind of circumstances kids are in. Some kids may be in homes where people are sick. Some kids may be in homes where family members are in long-term care homes and there's real anxiety and concern. Some kids may be in homes where parents are frontline workers, whether in healthcare or grocery stores. Those kids may be home alone most of the time. Um, some kids are in homes like ours where, again, all the privilege in the world in terms of online learning skills and, and tools but two parents who are working flat out to try to stand things up online. And so no one is necessarily in an optimal setting. Um, it's an equity issue to keep things simple for students. And Nick's gonna talk a little bit about some specific ways to do that. As soon as that moves forward. Changes forward, yeah. <clears throat> so, there are lots of things that we're tempted to do, as Bonnie was saying, um, when you're suddenly faced with, I'm used to having six hours with kids in a classroom, in a physical space where I've at least managed to, um, for better or worse, try and level that playing field between the students that I have access to. Uh, and you know that that's not the case now. So the temptation is to still try and fill up that time um, to feel like we need to to fill that void of school being taken away and um, that's just not realistic it's not it's not going to work for you and it's, it's certainly not going to work for students and parents who are working and so on so uh, kind of repeating that message of thinking about how we can do this as simply as possible uh, is really really key here uh, equitable designs are simple designs usually um, they are elegant designs, so there are things that that uh, that would work for everyone. So think about your user who may be sitting at home where there's one device shared between a family of five, or the alternative where there's lots of devices and one poor internet connection. So they've got to try and figure out how they're going to share all of these resources at once. Your your students probably don't have the six hours a day to work on stuff that they had before. It's just not not feasible. Um, so one of the things that I will say is planning for most people being able to access things on a mobile device is about as good as you can get. But what that does mean is that a lot of those tools that you're getting those helpful emails about saying, hey, look, we're going to give you this tool for, for free for the next two months and you're tempted to sign up for it and try it out and get your students to sign up for it. A lot of those things leave a lot to be desired and they, they don't work across all platforms. So anything that you are going to suggest your students do, you have to make sure that you at, as much as possible have tested that thing out and assure how it's going to work on different devices that people might be using and in different bandwidths. So um, as much as you can test that out, that's really important. The other thing I would say is that, um, you know, we're all in a synchronous session here. We're really lucky. We've got, hundreds of people in this session with us who are uh, all managing to listen to us and see us now, but that's not the reality for a whole lot of our students and parents. Um, and so there's a lot of pressure if you ever try to do something synchronous like this. There is a temptation to want to do that, to maintain connection, to be able to see each other, see your students, and I understand that, uh, but use it sparingly. Think about where it's best used. Um, think about the things that make most sense. So from an assessment perspective, um, 
you also have to think about flexibility and how you support students through this. One of the things that is a small thing, but it's challenging for kids when they suddenly now start to receive assignments through digital means is they'll see, um, they'll imagine that they have to complete that in the parameters that you've given them. And if those parameters are really restrictive, like you didn't really look at the date that you set on that and it was due, um, you know, at three o'clock this afternoon and you sent it out two o'clock this afternoon, that can cause a lot of anxiety and stress. And one of the things that I'm certainly seeing from parents is throwing up their hands and saying, this is just too hard because the goals are unrealistic and I can't support my kids and I feel like a failure. Um, and I, parents are getting a really quick and deep look at what you think pedagogy is. Uh, so that that message that you're communicating to students and to parents through the things that you're sending out uh, is really important to keep in mind because they often may not have had that level of insight before. They don't know what the tools were that students were using before. So they don't know what your kids are, are comfortable with. They don't know how to find those things. You really have to keep those things um, visible to everyone. Um, there's also, I know from the outside, at least there's not as much guidance as you might like on what that final assessment period is going to look like. But what at least appears to be happening right now is you have some, some flexibility to, to at least make sure that you have your workflows in place. So figure out what that one tool is that you're gonna to use to send kids their assessment pieces and that you expect them to submit things through rather than having them submit work across six different apps that's that's going to cause you and them a whole lot of stress. Um, and finally, we don't have kind of great <laughs> solutions for this, but when even in the world that we work in a lot, when people start to think about how do they differentiate um, instruction and how do they accommodate for differences in learning, uh, often that's not dealt with well, and often there aren't really good solutions for the things that you might need to accommodate. Sometimes in the uh, digital world, there are tools that, that can help level the playing field for students who need alternative assessment forms, who need um, uh, differentiated instruction. Sometimes that can help, but sometimes it can hinder as well. So you're all gonna be in this kind of boat of trying to figure out how, how to maintain your IEPs or adjust those so that they um, work in this online environment and um, you will find unfortunately that a lot of the tools that are being thrown at you as being free or as being signed up for now are not accessible in the way that they need to be. They are, there are some that are accessible from a technical point of view that work across a few different platforms, but cognitively might be uh, problematic from their user design. So you may get pushback from people uh, because of that. And, um, you know, at this point, we're all just trying to survive this next little piece. Depending on what happens over the summer, we don't know what, what our next step is gonna look like, but uh, these are some issues that we're gonna all have to be dealing with, and uh, there's no really great magic solutions to, to providing differentiated instruction for our students. And in a sense, that fact that we're all in the same boat, it means that you don't, this isn't something for you to solve independently or individually. Um, communicate with your colleagues, but also recognize that everyone's doing the best they can. Keep doing the best that you can. Keep reaching out and trying to get a sense of what your students need and where your students are. And then talk to folks who might have advice to offer about how to address those needs. And that's really the best that we're gonna be able to do. That is the best that we're ever able to do is um, we're not, school is never perfectly equitable to begin with. We all know that. But the, the four walls of the school and the six, seven hours of the school day create a different kind of playing field than we're currently working with. So what we're taking is the inequities that are already there and adding to them and amplifying them. No one's asking you to make those go away, but rather to recognize them be kind, be flexible, be as supportive as you can. Um, 
but don't take it as something you know that you need to suddenly become a complete expert in. So keep it simple, try to keep it equitable and be flexible and trust students and keep it engaging. This is kind of funny, um, <clears throat> kids. This is a colleague of ours uh, in BC named Clint Lalonde posted this on Facebook the other day. His kids apparently have gotten a little bored in the home environment and decided to cover everyone's family photos in the home with pictures of Danny DeVito. Um, didn't know Danny DeVito was so engaging, but I thought that was, was pretty funny. To an extent, when people choose to do something because it entertains them, they're more likely to, um, to put their full self into it. And so part of narrowing things down, keeping it simple, paring it down to three key things a week, when you're thinking of those key three key things, you want to think about things that are gonna be what your students can get the most out of. Um, doesn't have to be fun per se, not all learning needs to be fun, but it does need to be something that's, that's going to engage. And all of us who teach have tools that we've been using for years in terms of our voices and our bodies and our resources and different kinds of visuals and habits that engage and attract students, right, and help them focus. And the thing about online is that many of us often feel um, really kind of handcuffed when we first come online because we don't have those tools available to us in the same ways. And so the truth is, in online spaces, channels are limited and distractions are present. Um, so it does take direct effort, but there are a few things that we wanted to offer as ways to be engaging. One of them is you don't have to do it all yourself. Um, there are resources out there. Now, this is a quick shout out to uh, the U Windsor open page, um, Faculty of Education open page, which is a series of teacher to teacher reviews that my B Ed students, pre-service teachers, um, did this past year, plus my colleagues at the Faculty of Ed. These are short four minute videos and like 10, 15 minute podcasts about different tools and particularly about the um, data implications of different tools. So if you are thinking of using a different tool, it was one or two tools to add into your repertoire of what you're doing to engage students, maybe take a look and see if we've covered that because you want to understand, are these tools I, I want to use with students? What are the implications? How much data are they collecting? Um, we also have ideas in these reviews around differentiated learning for students. but you also don't need to be the creator of all the good things yourself. There are some amazing educational resources out there direct for students, right? If you look right above here, TED Ed, um, under the open page videos, that's a whole collection of learning videos for students. Um, there are all kinds of things. You don't need to make all the resources that you want to use to engage your students. If you're considering, oh, should I be making a video about X? If it is specific to your human voice and something that you want to share as a message to your students, great. If it's a, uh, here is a video about animals in the Sahara, that probably exists and you can find a great one out there. Hopefully that is Creative Commons licensed and available for teachers to share. You don't need to make it yourself. And so that doesn't, the engagement doesn't have to sit all on you. There are a ton of open supports, open resources, open educational resources out there for you to use. Um, five minutes Googling or talking to folks like Nick and Dave um, who, who work in that world can be a really great way to get a sense of what's out there for you and for your students. Next thing using visuals to communicate. I wanna go through a little how does this look piece um, because it's really hard to communicate online. And I'm just gonna slide this over here. This is Blackboard. I happen to teach in Blackboard. I teach digital technologies and social media to pre-service teachers. So this is just one of our lessons that we have through the year, it's, it's one week of communication. It's a lot of text because I have little pieces of content that I want them to explore. But there are actually a variety of tools that I use so that 
it organizes the information a little bit more than just throwing it onto the platform because none of the teaching platforms, Edsby, Google, Blackboard, doesn't matter, do great jobs of making stuff easily digestible and helping learners know what they need to take in. So there's three key things that I use. Um, the first one is bold text. If I have key ideas, I definitely push out the bold text um, and I pop it out. Next one is images. So in the middle there, I've broken up the wall of text with an image from the source that we're reading that tries to give a visual sense of the key idea that I want them to see. I also use little terms like key ideas, texts, and to do in bold so that they can directly see what the clear path that they're meant to follow is. So when they land on that page, it gives them some sense of flow and some sense of what to um, pull out from that. Make sure that if, particularly with younger students, but really with, with anybody, if you look at a giant piece of text with paragraphs on it on a screen, it can be really, really difficult to get a sense of what you need from that and so help learners by pulling it out for them and finally pull out the concepts right stick to the core ideas of what you're trying to teach rather than get students engaged in drill if you're putting worksheets online maybe pull back from that there are probably more key things that you want your learners to get out of those two or three ideas a week than repetitive drill. Um, conceptual lessons that have a practical application, you know, science through baking, whatever, um, or exploration, allow for learners to self-differentiate by going a little deeper or a little less deep. Um, and if you're grading, keep your grades and your feedback focused on main ideas. Um, so the, the little finicky, that's almost right, but right now, particularly because it's always harder to read intent and tone through print or text or online communications than it is through voice. Be gentle with your students, stick to those main concepts, make sure that they're getting a sense um, that they are on a learning curve and that they are beginning to, to get some key ideas. That's what they'll take out of this year, right? Is, okay, I, I grasped these few things out of the curriculum. It's okay if they do not get everything in there. They're not going to. We all need to take that off of our shoulders. Ultimately, at the end of it, this is about care. This is a, a clip from a little video that my own um, kids' school, King Edward, amazing staff, they put this out today. And it's a four minute video of all the different staff and faculty um, kind of waving at the kids, holding little signs that say, we miss you. And it's got this really nice message in it. And ultimately, we don't know what kind of circumstances students are learning in. Um, the more that we reach out and let them know that we are people who care about them as humans and care about their learning, the more learning that they may have the opportunity to engage in, the more likely they are to potentially let you know if there is a challenge that they're facing. These things matter. And, and when we walk out of our homes in the long run, these will be the things that people take with them, is what kind of care was expressed to me? What kind of um, opportunity did I have to become more of a human in this time, not what worksheets did I do a great job at? So, thank you. That is basically kind of our overview of simple and um, equitable and engaging today. Next week, we're doing two more webinars. Uh, you need to register for those separately. If you'd like to join us, we would love to have you. Number two is specifically for elementary educators. Um, we've got folks from uh, Hamilton, Thunder Bay, and Windsor, uh, who are teachers in the classroom who will be joining us to talk about what they're doing with their elementary students and some of their key tips. And then on Wednesday, April 22nd, also at 2 p.m., 
we have um, folks in Toronto, in China, uh, they're a little bit further ahead of us on the beginning to open society back up and schools back up curve, um, and potentially one other invite out from Windsor, but we'll see if that person is able to join us, uh, 2 p.m. To register for these, if you go to um, k12olaya.ca, you then need to click in on either the elementary picture or the high school picture, and that will take you to the live registration link. WordPress, tech is not always what you would like it to be. WordPress themes don't allow us to put the link as clickable on the main landing page for that. But that is what we're offering. Um, so. Okay, so we do have a bunch of questions. There are 15 in the question room right now. Um, you guys can go ahead and put your questions in and um, you can upload questions. I, however, am a bit of a tyrant, so I will pick out questions that I think are gonna work uh, at a given time, so I do apologize. Um, I think the one I'd love to start out with, and I think I'll flip this to you, Bonnie, because it, it sort of connects with what you were saying, which is from Stephanie, how much do you suggest the students submit each week? I mean, ideally, I would, speaking, this is me speaking as a parent. Um, my kids are likely to manage to put in two or three meaningful assignments a week that they're spending time on that I'm looking at and maybe going, hey, can we take a second look at this? Um, maybe even four, but certainly not more, um, particularly with parents working and multiple kids in a home. So I'm trying to think of this whole thing in kind of rules of three. Um, if, if you've got, if you're asking for three things a week, that's probably about what you're going to get that's good. Beyond that, you're dealing in the, hmm, maybe. You can give people extra stuff like, hey, go to Khan Academy and, um, you know, if you have a kid who needs to spend time, needs the structure of this, there are all kinds of online supports where kids can spend more time learning, but it shouldn't be a submission. I would also say, can I just add to that, that um, one of the things that I think is, is useful thinking about is uh, some kind of larger project that, ex that spans over those multiple days that, you know, going back to the idea of engagement, um, uh, a thing that, it, that kids can work on little pieces of every day. Uh, they, f they kind of feel like there's something accomplished. And I've seen, you know, both of my kids are in elementary, uh, and they have, they can work on those things offline. They can go away and do that work and build things, and um, you know they they feel engaged in that in that work. Uh, and it's it, there's less pressure to try and upload something every single day. Um, and and there, I know that they there are parents in our kind of immediate circle and family and friends who are who are always thinking about this. My kids are getting really anxious because they don't know where to upload this thing. They don't know what they're supposed to submit. Was this one, this one was sent out as an assignment, but it doesn't say anything about returning it. Does that mean I have to submit it? Or was it just because that was the tool that they sent it out through? These are all the things that, you know, all of you teachers are working through at the same time as well. This seems like it's easy to push this out through here. So maybe we can do that. But um, yeah, minimizing those, that would be really helpful. I think for everyone. Um, the next question that I'm going to take is from uh, Bonnie's aunt, so I have to take it. Sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm actually contractually obliged to take this as my next question. Um, are there any rules of thumb or best practice around choosing asynchronous or synchronous learning? And that's one of those questions that we've been dealing with in the class that I'm teaching right now all the time. If you're going to do, synchronous learning has to be your second choice. Asynchronous should come first. And, and Nick mentioned this earlier, every time you force someone into a synchronous situation, you totally revamp the life that they're having inside their house, right? So right now, we have had to put people away in our house and, and have to reorganize our houses to get this done, but we knew this was gonna happen in church and we're in charge of the time when we set this. Whereas when you say you need to be there at one o'clock in the afternoon, you don't know if that child's uh, mother has a meeting she needs to be in or the father has to go to work at the grocery store, like you don't know what's happening in that house. So the, every time you can do it asynchronously instead of synchronously, I think that's the choice you should make. Uh, but there are cases where like with our kids theater group, it's tough for them to practice their play. 
without doing it synchronously. Um, so there are cases, but I would say anytime you can do synchronously, anytime you can do it asynchronously, anytime you can do it when it's not at the same time, that's the choice to make. Can I add to that? Hi. Yeah, you sure can. Um, for me, when I do like regular online learning that I've planned for a course that's meant to go like online was always meant to be online. Um, I often will over a 12 week term have uh, sort of four synchronous sessions and I ask, you know, my students are all adults, they're all university students, but I'll say, please attend three. And I do one at the beginning and one at the end and maybe two in between, just to try to build a little bit of that sense of belonging and a sense of each other as humans who are placed in the world. That's all very nice. But right now, people's capacity is just so differently stretched and this is, this is not normal circumstances. So if I were teaching a course right now for students of any age, I might try to do a couple of like, put out a long-term plan. I will be here in this space at this time. If you can't come, totally okay. But it does give you that chance to do a little bit of the connecting and extroverting with people for those who need it. Those who don't, they don't have to be there. Um, so we got another question. There's several questions here that I'm trying to pull into one question because we've only got about 15 minutes. I want to try to get to all the questions. And that's about what to do with students at varying levels, but also var so varying levels of access, but also various levels inside of your class. So when you're trying to teach a math at three different levels inside your class, right? When you're trying to make those adjustments. Um, there's a really great project that, um, that's being done in Brazil right now where they're organizing the content to be doable in a house, whether or not they have online, um, they've got good online connectivity. Right, so in some houses there may be two computers, but there may be two parents on those computers all day working. So the kids don't have a long period of time they can spend on that computer, but they do have access to it. So what they're trying to do is design all their activities so that they're workable by everybody at each level. So an example that she gave me in an interview I did today, and I'll drop that interview into the chat room, was uh, a radio show. And she said, well, some people are actually recording the video of the radio show. And some people who don't have a lot of uh, connectivity are recording the audio on a phone and sending that in from the phone because the audio uh, isn't as big and it's a little easier to handle. And some other people are actually doing the radio show for people in their house and then writing about it afterwards. So in each case, you've got the same activity, which is doing the same kind of presentation skills and organization and the objectives you might be going for the radio show, but you're giving options for people so that they can adjust them to their space. So from a connectivity issue in the rural areas for that question, that's an issue. In terms of adjusting for levels, it's the same as it was face to face, right? It's the same hard work. It's the same trying to get your mind into the place of the student. It really doesn't change when it comes online. Yeah. Anybody else want to follow up on that? Uh, okay, so I'll keep going. Uh, Bonnie mentioned that Zoom is good for webinars like this, but not necessarily for more interactive teaching environment. Is there a certain number of people where Zoom does work well? for a more interactive teaching experience? My own issues with Zoom are actually less around um, numbers and particularly around Zoom as a meeting platform. There's a difference between Zoom meetings and Zoom webinars. So the webinar structure in Zoom means that you folks are not automatically recorded. You folks are not automatically captured on camera. You should not be putting out Zoom photos of your students if you do meet with them synchronously, synchronously online. Like there are a lot of practices that um, people may mean well and think, oh, look, I met with my students. I'm going to take this cute screen capture and put it on Twitter. I don't, that actually goes against a student's rights to, to not be captured on screen and, and promoted. Um, and two, um, there's, there's a real issue with you don't know the situation that your students are in. Maybe they don't want to show you their home setting um, for any variety of reasons. And so that's one of the Zoom pieces. Um, there's also the fact that Zoom itself as a platform, when you're using meetings and the small class settings, um, it does something called attention tracking, where we, the webinar piece does not do that. Um, but I don't want a platform that has a built-in, baked-in pedagogy that assumes that because a student is staring at this screen, that means they're paying attention. 
Um, so I think that our school boards have made uh, reasonable and well thought out decisions in discouraging people from using Zoom for a variety of reasons. Um, but for large one to many webinar purposes with voluntary adults, that's different. It's a different power relation, all of those pieces. I would also suggest that um, it, like many of the other tools that people might be signing up for and wanting people to use, uh, it's a really powerful tool. There are lots of things that you have to know about it to make to be able to use it safely um, so it's kind of like if we you've been driving a little Mazda 3 for your entire life and then suddenly one day you woke up and there was a there was a jet parked in your front lawn and uh, someone just gave you the keys and said you'll be fine you can drive a car you can't lots of these things are really difficult to to use well without being kind of dangerous and uh, and you have to really know what those, uh, as Damien says, terms and conditions are about and know where to find your privacy statements and what those things mean. That's what people like us do all the time. And even so, even then, we, we still don't know what uh, some of these things are, are capable of. Yeah, and Randy points out that the BC Ministry licensed Zoom and, and meets privacy issues. Uh, boards here have made different decisions Basically, if your board has said, go ahead and try it, then within the caveat of don't do a ton of synchronous, encourage parents as well as teachers not to share screenshots of particularly minors, but even adults when they're on Zoom, all of these things matter. And when we're diving kind of for the first time into online ed, it's easy to make a lot of mistakes with something that's synchronous. And I don't mean mistakes like in the, oh, the tech didn't work, but rather places where, where we're infringing on rights and data privacy issues. Yeah, the oh, the tech didn't work stuff happens all the time. It just happened to our website. It went down for about uh, 15 or 20 seconds there. So for you, those of you who are trying to get in, it turns out there's a lot of you trying to get in. So we apologize for that, but just keep trying. Um, I think we've got a question that I'd love to do next, and I think it's a great time for us to apply the framework that you're talking about, Bonnie. Uh, so the question is, is um, so the reason I say that is, one of the great things about a framework like the one that Bonnie is proposing is that you can use it as a guide, as a guidepost to sort of ask your questions to the framework. That's the purpose for having them. So the question is, I've heard a lot about plagiarism, especially at the secondary level. How would you suggest teachers tackle plagiarism at this time? So in terms of thinking about education as simple, equitable and engaging, when you're working online, you are inherently working in an environment where real-time testing students are in a Google world, right? Um, probably there's a very real need to consider unless your um, institution or your board or whatever has gone to a proctoring sort of, we're going to monitor all the online tests service and I have really, really strong feelings about those. Um, I think that this is a great opportunity to actually lower the stakes, um, to consider that maybe testing right now is not equitable. Um, and frankly, in an online environment is not the simplest thing to do. Um, so if there is any way that to meet the core objectives of what you're hoping your students will learn, because just because you teach it doesn't mean they learn it anyway, no matter how perfect the setting is. Um, but in order to meet the, the core objectives, consider boiling stuff down so that you're getting students to do the stuff that where the research actually maybe matters, where they where you're using the fact that they have Google available to them and other people available to them doesn't necessarily counter um, what you're trying to get out of them. And if you do need to test, then you'll need to work that out. Robert points out like Grammarly has a free plagiarism checker. There are a ton of free plagiarism checkers. The thing that I would myself think about is that in this environment, um, try to build assignments that to the extent that you can based on what you teach, you're considering having students apply the ideas that you've decided are core to the circumstances that they're in so that if they're writing an essay about 
um, you know, their life at home in whatever your town is in the pandemic, that's going to be less hard to find online. <laughs> um, I know that not everything can go that way. We're going to, we can talk about this a little bit more in the high school setting, like during the high school webinar. Um, but also I would encourage teachers to go out and Google, what are some good assignments that aren't just mastery learning? What are some good assignments in my field that are simple and equitable and engaging, but mean that my students aren't going to be necessarily plagiarizing those at the same time, Maybe your students are plagiarizing assignments right now because their lives are set up that they can't succeed at assignments. Possibly we shouldn't be having zero sum testing or assignments right now. I also just add one caution to all of those um, plagiarism checking tools. Keep all of that information that you give them forever. That's how they work, right? So if you're asking students to submit materials through, um, through one of those tools, and you're asking them to give or give their IP to the to those tools and they will be kept forever. Uh, and I will also add that they often tend to provide a false sense of security. Um, they're not actually very good at their job. So um, they, they may not be the best solution. So I, I maybe one of the, the next questions we can do, and this may be something we all want to address. Um, uh, Damien was asking, or actually David was asking, how to be, you're talking about being engaging online. I was wondering if you couldn't like elaborate a little bit more about the ways in which that kind of engagement can happen. I'll, I'll, I'll pick it first and then maybe we'll go around the table with it. Um, the more you can get your students interacting with each other, the more they can engage with each other around an issue that isn't necessarily a yes or no question, that isn't a fact they based question that they're trying to get an answer to, but that they can comment on it. So if I was gonna to put together an activity right now and I was thinking about what Bonnie said earlier about um, the Saharan animals, I didn't know she had an interest in those. And you look at what's happening at a lot of zoos right now where they're doing live feeds from the zoos. And that had been a comment that somebody said in the text chat. You can do an activity where you say, if you can go and watch this piece of, go find a zoo and talk about the animals there and have a conversation and show and have the students sort of almost teach each other, like bring their own examples in, bring their own, I found this thing that's really cool, you should check that out, it shows that animal from whatever. Those kinds of sharing activities where students are really um, getting excited about the work each other is doing, particularly at the younger grades too, can be a really great way of getting people engaged, that it's not just you presenting the material and the students receiving the material, it ends up being a more engaged conversation. Bonnie. Um. I'm going to build on that and just say that most of the platforms that any kind of school board or institution has as a base do allow for some sort of student to student engagement, right? So building, some, and I'm not usually a massive fan of discussion boards. Often discussion boards online can be very stilted, but if you build in a question that is engaging and fun and hey, go out and find this and share with fellow and, and ask people to comment or engage with other people's stuff, then there is that capacity for students, particularly at the younger ages, I think, to, to be like, oh, look, it's, it's a person. I'm watching my, my little one, um, she's in sixth grade, and on Edsby, her teacher's doing a really great job of building little pieces where they can share what they're finding and all of those, those things with each other, which also serves to keep some of that feeling of a class, right, and that's some, that's some of that feeling of belonging. And it doesn't demand that everybody's putting stuff in. Some students are engaging more than others, but that's okay too, right? That's, that's often the case. Um, just back to the, the previous point as well, Darren Stanley, hey Darren, has made an excellent point in the chat that in terms of the plagiarism question and, and all of this around engagement, finding information is taxonomically different from comparing or analyzing or creating information. So if you think about sort of the Bloom's taxonomy of teaching, maybe consider some of those higher order pieces, um, those higher order assignments as things to actually bring in right now. If you're only going to do three main things a week, make them higher order things to the extent that you can. Nick, you're nodding your head. I'm agreeing. I'm agreeing with you all. Um, I, I think, yeah, providing opportunities, providing some space for, for students to be able to interact with each other is one thing that 
right about now they're for those that are not um, connected with each other outside of the school realm in other ways that um, they're kind of looking for that. I know that, you know, my six year old has discovered Edsby and we had to have a conversation about what's appropriate to post in a public space. And he had, he had no concept that this, uh, this stream of consciousness that was happening between him and one of his little buddies was visible to everyone. Um, so those are really fun conversations for us to be able to have right now, but they're looking for that kind of space. And they were to some extent talking about the project that they were working on that week, uh, got off track really quickly, but that's what happens with six year olds, uh, <laughs> especially when you give them access to a tablet and a platform that they can post in. Um, that's what happens with learning, right? And yeah, it, exactly. Um, there's a really great core foundational concept to online learning, uh, come out of Athabasca about 20 years ago, and it's the idea of presence, online presence, and the idea that online presence in any kind of learning environment is partly the content, right? It's partly the teacher, and it's partly the social presence. And any time that you're giving students the, the opportunity to interact with each other, then you are giving them the opportunity to be part of each other's learning and to create that social presence. That has a huge impact and has been shown over 20 years of research to really matter in terms of student learning, that some of the things people retain may not actually be content, but what they kind of picked up from peers and from that social presence. So I think that's really positive in this moment because it gives us ways to enable students to be part of continuing each other's learning. And so we've just reached the top of the hour. I am sorry for those people whose questions we did not get to. There were a lot of them in there. We did our best. Uh, Bonnie, why don't you close this out? Folks, I am so grateful to you for taking the time to join us today. Uh, this is going to be posted live. We do strongly encourage you to go to k12.oliah.ca, if the website hasn't crashed again, um, and click on either the elementary or high school panel. Hopefully we'll see you Monday or Wednesday. Let your friends know if you think this might be of value. Uh, we have really, really great panelists joining us who are doing this in the K-12 classroom Thanks for coming out. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.